Good afternoon, good afternoon everyone. So I'm from the Institute of Marine Affairs, the IMA, and not the IMO or EMA. Um, and I'm gonna just um, talk about the IMA role in coastal and ocean governance. Now, in the 1970s, we had visionaries. We had Dr. Lennox Bala and Professor Ken, Ken Ch Julian Kenny. And they were actually the guys who were behind the formation of the Institute of Marine Affairs. Um, IMA, basically back then, Professor Kenny said, you know, we live on an island with our backs to the ocean. And they recognized, even back then, that there was a need for scientific data to inform decisions. So we were set up by the UNDP back in 1976, but we were formalized by an act of parliament and we became operational in 1978. Our mission is to conduct and foster research and to provide advice for the sustainable management of the coastal and marine resources for Trinidad and Tobago. So our role is advisory as opposed to regulatory, and I think people tend to mix this up with the EME, which is a regulatory agency. Now, which is, this is just an idea of our mandate. So we basically um, conduct research on the marine and coastal environment. We have different programs. Um, we have biodiversity. We, um, in terms of our programs, we have oceanographic and coastal processes. So we monitor the physical environment. We have GIS capabilities. We have um, marine governance and policy. We have fisheries and aquaculture and we have environmental quality program. So, um, so we, we basically conduct research, applied and fundamental research, and also to we, we do a lot of public outreach and education, and we've been doing this over the years. So back in 2010, when you know, there was a sort of transition period, and I'll tell, you, tell it like a story, um, the researchers at the institute got together to do strategic planning which was necessary at that point. And when we sat together, we realized that right there and then, we were just documenting the demise of our coastal and marine environment. So we decided, listen, I mean, that's not what we want to do. So we started to advocate at that point. Um, our director then was Commodore Franklin, who was a former Coast Guard um, officer. And we started to advocate the ministry then to develop an integrated coastal zone policy because we saw this as a necessary in intervention to address the issues that we were basically investigating or reporting. And to help us with that, at that time, the government was also um, negotiating a loan with the IDB for climate a climate loan, and it became a conditionality for the loan because ICZM internationally is recognized as a mechanism for countries to adapt to climate change impacts. So, in terms of our advocating, um, in 2012, the then cabinet appointed a multi-sectoral committee, um, steering committee to develop an integrated coastal zone policy framework strategies and action plan. And there were, um, on the committee, we had representation from major ministries, fisheries, forestry, maritime services, Ministry of Energy, Tourism, Works and Transport. We had NGO, we had a representative from COPE, um, Town and Country Planning, and the committee was chaired by the Institute. We also, um, uh, we had what we call thematic working groups, and we seconded people from different ministries and NGOs and so on, and in terms of economic and social development, natural resource assessment, public education and awareness, and then of course vulnerability assessment and adaptation to climate change. Um, at that time, there was a number of standing committees, so we would have met with the, those standing committees. We would have reviewed policies. But our approach to the developing this policy was because of our political climate and the fact that we were changing government every five years, you know, the political cycle, we thought that it would be better for us to actually get buy-in from the ground. So we had over 19 public consultation throughout Trinidad and Tobago with communities, mainly coastal communities, as well as user groups. And we went out there, we asked them, what, are you, what do you think are the problems? And what are the problems we ought to address by an integrated coastal zone policy? So that was the approach we took. And also to in doing that, 
the IDB funded a technical cooperation. At that time, um, it was to do a project piloting the integration of climate change, adaptation, and coastal zone management in Southwest Tobago. And under this TC, we were able to consult or hire a consultant to do a legal and institutional gap analysis. So we had um, Dr. Rajendra Ram Logan um, actually look at the legislation with regards to ocean governance. And basically, what he realized is that, well, we have 27 convention applicable to ocean governance, ocean and coastal governance, but only four express, uh, expressed in the law of Trinidad and Tobago, and those are the ones that are listed there. Um, because of the being a common law country and because of our legal system, um, it requires that treaties and conventions to make it, it has to make its way through Parliament to become binding nationally. So we, ha we are signatory and we've signed on to a lot of international treaties, but they, they have no local standings, unfortunately. And the non-legislating of international legal instru instruments has diminished the ability of international law to assist with ocean governance locally. Also, too, there were 24 policies identified as touching some aspects of coastal or ocean management. There's policies and plan, and they were sort of um, divided into biodiversity. So we have fisheries policy, we have wetlands policy, we have protected areas policy, we have the pollute policies that address pollution, primarily the national environmental policy under the EMA, and the integrated solid waste resource management policy. We have industry-based policy on tourism, ecotourism, yachting, energy, and so on. And then we have development policy and plans. So we have these policies to deal with renewable energy, innovation, development planning, and so on. So we have all these different um, policies and so on in place. And in terms of the legislative framework, we have 20 pieces of legislation that can potentially address coastal and ocean governance. And we have a multiplicity of laws. Because of the multiplicity of laws and policy impacting on the ocean, it gives rise to as much as 29 institutions having a defined legal and policy rule. And that's a situation for chaos. In the sense that you have a lot of overlapping jurisdiction, you have duplication of work, and many times one of the biggest problems we have is that a lot of agencies operate in silos and because of that they're not talking to each other things are not going the way they ought to go so the ICZM policy basically um, has taken that as a major issue that has to be addressed the coordination and cooperation among different entities both government agencies but also with the private sector so the committee met for two years, we had all our, went through our process, and in 2014, we produced an integrated coastal management policy framework for Trinidad and Tobago. One of the things we discovered as well when we were doing the legal and, and gap analysis is that we had no definition for a coastal zone in Trinidad. There was none that existed in our, in our laws. Um, when there was a case that came up in front of the High Court, I think we had to use the definition in the Barbados coastal zone policy. So one of the things that we did in the, the policy is to define the coastal zone. So uh, this is the definition. It shall mean all area of seas extending to the limit of the exclusive economic zone and includes the shoreline and coastal lands, which are inland areas above the high water mark that influence the quality or composition of coastal waters or are influenced in some way by their proximity to coastal waters. So for the purpose of the policy, we divided the coastal zone into different regions. So the first zone was the terrestrial zone, which T1, which was the immediate and direct impact area, and that was the area along the coast from the low water mark at mean low water up to the five meter contour. And the reason for that is that a study was done that showed that the areas that are most vulnerable from impacts from climate change, sea level rise, as well as storm surge were below the five meter contour. So that was our zone of immediate and direct impact. And then between the five meter contour and the 70 meter contour, we use that as the zone of influence or area of influence because that's where 90% of our development occur in terms of housing, industry, agriculture, and so on. And whatever happens in that zone influences the ocean and the coastal zone and ocean in general. 
And on the seaward side, we had the immediate and direct impact zone, and that went up to the three, three nautical miles. And we used that. That came out of the EMA water pollution rule, which was the coastal waters. And then we had the territorial sea that extended from that three, the three nautical miles to 12, and also to the, and then uh, the final zone was the exclusive economic zone, which extended to the 200 nautical miles. And we included all of this. So I have basically, this is what it looks like in terms of this is the land, the terrestrial boundary, and this is the sea boundary. And what I can tell you is Trinidad and Tobago have 15 times more sea than we have land. Right? And so therefore, and the sea is also very important, as mentioned before, to our existence. So really and truly, we need to improve what we're doing. So we developed the policy in 2014 and we submitted it. But you would have, by then, we would have had a change in administration. So you know, things take a while before it kicks back into action. During that period as well, the IDB funded another technical cooperation, and it was to a design and feasibility of a risk resilient ICZM program. And basically, the program had three components. One was a coastal risk data and information assessment because in doing the modeling for the TC in Tobago, we recognized that there's a lot of data gaps, especially with regards to physical data, waves, currents, bathymetry, you know, ocean data. So we needed to data on storm surges and wave heights and so on. So they identified the, the data gaps and also to even where data is available, it is not readily accessible. So some sort of mechanism to have that data readily available for data for decision making. The second component was some demonstration projects. So they looked at a number of areas, particularly areas where erosion was critical. And they came up with four pilot projects. And the areas they chose was Guayaquari, San Susi, Speyside and Tobago, and one of the four areas they were looking at was Otaheite, Central Gulf of Paria. And the reason for that was because the other areas all had to do with hard engineering structures. And we had a problem with that because it is not something that you promote for climate change adaptation. So we wanted an example of an area where we can use some soft engineering structures. And so that's why Otaheite was considered in terms of putting in mangroves or something to that effect. So the intent of this, of course, they would have built on what would have done originally by Dr. Ram Logan and stuff, and they looked at the institutional capacity and the needs to strengthen the institutions for integrated coastal zone management. With that, they prepared, they prepared a loan agreement. So basically, they did a study, and they prepared the loan agreement. So now they've presented it to the government, and the government will have to take a loan to implement. So that was presented last year. So while that period of inertia. The Institute took a decision that we were going to prepare a state of marine environment report 2016. And basically what we did is, you know, as scientists, we love to write long, boring, technical reports, right, that nobody reads. So we took a decision. We were going to do something very simple, very pretty. Um, pretty in the sense that it has a lot of pictures and stuff, but it's not pretty pictures because it's depicting what is happening in our marine environment. So we prepared this report based on our research and some of our main findings, of course, pollution, especially in the Gulf of Paria, and we have pollution from the energy sector in terms of the hydrocarbons, but we also have from nutrients, sediments, heavy metals, and sewage. We looked at our mangrove forests, you know, something that I love very much. Um, and it, so we noticed that it continued to be clear to facilitate build development. And of course, you know, the recent research has shown the importance of mangroves with regards to coastal protection and with regards to uh, adaptation to climate change. And what you have happening in Trinidad is that you have erosion occurring in some areas on the seaward side. So as erosion occurs and the salt water goes further inland, the mangroves will migrate landward. But if you have a road or a house or some development, there's nowhere for the mangroves to go. So you have a phenomenon known as coastal squeeze. So we're starting to experience things like coastal squeeze where we're going to squeeze out these same mangroves that are there to protect us. We have lost a lot of our seagrass beds. 
right here in the peninsula, we had very lush Talassia beds, turtle grass, and used to be you know, a lot of green turtles that would be feeding. We had a lot of biodiversity. We've lost all of that. Our coral reef, as mentioned before, in the region, there's been degradation. Um, Several species of commercially important fish have been fully exploited, overexploited, and coastal erosion continues in areas and it has been impacting directly on people's lives and livelihoods. Also too, with the degradation of the coastal and marine ecosystem, mainly from these anthropogenetic impacts, these, we have become more vulnerable to other impacts such as climate change and emerging issues, things like the sagassum. A couple of years ago we had a serious issue with sagassum, as well as with lionfish, the invasion of the lionfish, which we are trying to develop a management plan for. So to arrest the degradation of these, of our coastal and marine and um, resources, there's an immediate need for policy and legislative intervention. And I was at the Ocean Conference a couple weeks ago, and it was said when it becomes urgent, it's already too late. But we're at that stage. And, but when we presented this report to our ministry, right, our minister, she wanted to take it to cabinet. And to take it to cabinet, she wanted us to prepare an action plan to address the issues that were identified. And so, the action plan was actually the implementation of the integrated coastal zone policy, which we would have presented two years ago. So, the cabinet agreed to the implementation of the action plan for the integrated coastal zone policy to mitigate the negative impacts on the coastal and marine environment from 2017 to 2020 and to establish an interministerial committee to guide the plan for the implementation of the ICZM policy framework. The interministerial committee, this is basically the terms of reference, review and finalize the policy, oversee the implementation of the policy framework, identify key targets and indicators, assign action item to most relevant agency and co-op other as may be required for the implementation of the action plan, prepare annual status report, and of course coordinate the production of a biannual state of the marine environment report. Now, so we're waiting right now. Um, letters have been sent to the different ministries asking them for representation on this committee. So we're waiting for the committee to be appointed. In the interim, this is what the IMA is doing. Hopefully by end of August, early September, we will be installing in the Gulf of Paria a water quality monitoring buoy that will collect data on real time and transmit it. And we're the, it's, it's being done in, with Microsoft. This is a partnership, public-private partnership with Microsoft, as well as with Fijisu. So it's going to have, um, basically it's going to go to the cloud and it's going to be, you'll be able to download it on, the intent is to download it on your phone. So you can have real time information so you can tell when something is going to happen, right? So that is hopefully going in by the beginning of September. We're also undertaking a pilot project here in the Northwestern Peninsula to develop a, a plan that will be aligned to the policy and integrated coastal zone plan, but also a marine spatial plan. Because you have so many things happening in a very small space right here along this peninsula. And there needs to be some coordination and management. So we have started that process. We have also developed programs to manage and control the introduction. We're developing programs to manage and control the introduction of alien invasive species. So we would have done a sagassum response plan, and we're developing a lionfish management plan and we've started doing a port baseline assessment because as mentioned before shipping is a means of invasive species being introduced and again we have identified significant degraded coastal areas which we hope to rehabilitate and most importantly we're working to develop and implement a public education campaign that addresses land-based sources of pollution and we're doing this with her NGO so again it's about building partnerships and linking and coordinating and that sort of stuff so some of the challenges political and administrative system. When the government change, things take a while before it sets back up. Again, there's a lack of coordination between agency and sectors, and as a cultural thing that we need to change. Inadequate knowledge and understanding of many of our ocean systems, 
and sometimes we don't have the capacity to acquire the information so there's that need to build that capacity or lack of lack of access to data or information you know the it, information may be available but it's not easily accessible so there needs to be some mechanism to centralize information limited evaluation and monitoring even when we have interventions are they working and of course a passive public and I put that in because after we launched the State of the Marine Environment report there was a lot of public outcry most people were concerned that they were bathing in sewage but that because you had that public outcry you had action on the part of the government so we need that public to be aware and to be a more active and be advocates and with that I thank you